I uh, first met uh, John Scully, I guess, about four years ago when I was invited out to Apple to see a new product they were working on called the Macintosh. And I guess like a lot of people, I was wondering what this uh, uh, former president of Pepsi-Cola could uh, bring to the uh, personal computer industry. And in fact, uh, in the, the time that's followed, John Scully has really become a living legend in the industry. And we're really very proud to uh, have for the first time uh, at the BCS, John Scully, the President, Chief Executive Officer, and Chairman of Apple Computer. Thank you very much. I was sitting down here in the audience next to uh, a gentleman who had his uh, good-looking uh, blue suit and white shirt and uh, red tie, and he looked over at me and he said, gosh, if I knew this was an informal affair, I wouldn't have dressed up. And, and I said, you don't understand. I am dressed up. <laughs> Perhaps that's how much I've changed since I've gone to California. It really is more than 3,000 miles from East Coast corporate America to uh, high-tech Silicon Valley. And what I'd like to do this evening is to share with you some of those experiences. In fact, uh, I've just finished writing a book, and the book is called Odyssey, Pepsi to, to Apple. Uh, many times when a CEO writes a book, it's kind of looking back on their life and trying to put things together in some neat monument that uh, will not be flawed in any way because they obviously didn't make any mistakes during their career, and tells you what they have accomplished. And when I came out with a book, um, while I'm still at Apple and still uh, hopefully uh, somewhere in the, in the middle of, of my career, uh, people said, well, why did you want to write a book? Now, why didn't you wait like everybody else? Don't you understand that's what you're supposed to do? You're not supposed to talk about these kinds of things. Well, what they didn't understand was that uh, I wasn't trying to write a book about the history of Apple or the history of Pepsi uh, or my own uh, autobiography. Rather, what I was trying to do was to use these as reference points that have shaped my experience uh, just as the world has gone through a transition from the industrial age to the information society over the past 10 years. Half of that time I spent as CEO of a second wave, very successful industrial age company, Pepsi-Cola company, and the other half of that time I've spent uh, here at Apple Computer. And I think that uh, just the mere fact of being able to look at the world through two different lenses has given me the chance to at least compare and contrast the differences between those two different uh, economic concepts of the industrial age and the information society. And what I was trying to do was not to talk about what has happened, but rather to set the stage for the things that I think are possible as we move into the last years of the 20th century. And not only possible, but I would suggest necessary, because I'm concerned, as I'm sure many of you are, that here we are in America with our competitiveness in retreat, with our education priorities somewhat uh, in doubt as to whether they are the uh, right ones and whether they're well understood by those who are in policy positions to be able to make those kinds of priorities. And at a time when there seems to be a heavy dose of cholesterol uh, injected into many of our institutional systems. So what can we do to promise a better world for those who are still in college, uh, those who are young managers or middle managers and who are going to be hitting their stride as we cross over into the next century. Uh, why should they inherit uh, a world that isn't at least as good as the one which all of us inherited? And I think there's still some options that we have that are very different than those that are being presented by many of our, our leaders in government, in business, in academia, that might be considered uh, as to what we could do to make it a lot more exciting as we enter the 21st century. So that was the basic idea behind the book, but the book is uh, more than uh, just a set of ideas. Uh, it's also an adventure story, and when I wrote it, I wanted to write a book that you didn't have to be a computer expert or you didn't have to be a business expert in order to enjoy it. 
because as anyone who has followed uh, the personal computer industry saga knows uh, that it has been a roller coaster ride. It's still an industry that's young enough that most of the personalities that have shaped it are still alive and well and thriving, and it's one which has become a part of the uh, American folk legend, at least in, in business terms. And uh, I felt that uh, telling the story, at least from the perspective of someone who has been one of the players on the, on the stage, uh, would be interesting to uh, many people who still don't know very much about personal computers. I hope you can appreciate just how different it is for someone who had worked for 16 years in a large, successful corporation to move from the East Coast out to the West Coast and go to Silicon Valley. I remember the first three days that I was at Apple uh, that I went to my first off-site off down at a place called Pajaro Dunes, which is on the Pacific Ocean. And this is very different than any management meeting I'd ever been to. The meetings I had been to, uh, the agendas were carefully prepared, you know, the analysis always done ahead of time. We sort of knew the outcome of the meetings before they even began. But this meeting was probably better described as a free-for-all because <laughs> everyone had their own opinion about what we ought to be doing and everyone wanted to talk about it all at once until the chandelier started to shake and I discovered that uh, I was in my first earthquake and someone yelled, run for the beach. And we all ran outside and ran for the beach and then someone yelled, said, wait a minute, the last time we ran for the beach we had a tidal wave, run for the dunes. <laughs> and that was kind of how we did almost everything. <laughs> And I wasn't the only one who had trouble understanding what uh, Silicon Valley was, was like, and Apple in particular. I remember uh, one time uh, AT&T came out to visit Apple. They were visiting everybody in those days. And they showed up uh, in a way that they thought would make us feel comfortable. So they all came out in casual clothes. And of course, we wanted to make them feel comfortable, so we showed up in suits and ties. <laughs> it's a weird meeting. <laughs> After we reorganized Apple in 1985, a lot of people wondered whether the best of Apple would just be a series of anecdotal stories and that there wouldn't be any uh, more innovation, any more dreams, uh, that we would become a very traditional corporation and, in fact, even bend to the many, many people who were advising us that if we didn't adopt a clone technology and put the Apple logo on it, or if we didn't at least broadly licensed the Macintosh technology to everyone to be able to produce it so that somebody could get uh, a product out there that had slots, then there wasn't going to be any, any future for not only the Macintosh, but even Apple itself. We chose not to do that. We decided that uh, the best decision, the least risk decision, was not to take the safest course, that we had to tighten down our uh, internal controls. We had to run the company with uh, greater focus and greater order and discipline, but we didn't have to abandon the, the dream. And to the contrary, uh, we had to learn from the mistakes that we had made, that I had made, um, and begin to invest in the technology even more, not abandon the technology. And that's exactly what we did over the last two years. And as many of you know, we increased our research and developments from uh, something around $40 million per year up to uh, this year we'll spend, I guess we just did spend about $190 million uh, in the past year in research and development and introduced over 50 products this year alone. The success in this industry will always be based upon innovation. Uh, yes, you have to have standards, uh, but you also have to have innovative technologies that will add value and will give a reason to be able to do the kinds of things that so many of us believe in, and that is to take personal computing well beyond where it is today. One of those people who really cares a lot about where personal computing will go is Bill Atkinson. And Bill, as many of you know, is the fellow who not only did QuickDraw and did Mac Paint, uh, but also has done the remarkable work on HyperCard. HyperCard was perhaps the only technology that somehow Forgot, got forgotten. Uh, almost every other technology that is in the Macintosh today 
has its origins in some way back in the 1960s or early 70s, long before Apple was even founded as a company. But the one that got forgotten was hypertext. And as we looked out to the future, to what was going to be the kind of computer that we would all personally want to have at the turn of the century, it was becoming more and more obvious that we had to have the capabilities of hypertext. We had to have the ability of organizing information by association to be able to make the computer more intuitive, to be able to address very, very large databases, and to be able to access information at a time when information would be uh, far larger in quantity than, than anything we're experiencing today. In fact, uh, it's estimated that information in quantity doubles uh, every three to four years. So we would either be overwhelmed by information by the turn of the century, or we would learn to cope with it. And hypertext was a key technology platform that we had to have in place. So about two years ago, uh, Bill Atkinson, who had been working on some ideas with hypertext, uh, decided that he could build a product. And this is a product which eventually was introduced at Macworld here in Boston in August. And it's one which has probably had uh, more excitement around it, uh, perhaps even more importance than anything that we've done since the Macintosh itself. And in fact, there are even some who think it may be uh, at least as significant, if not more significant in ways than the Macintosh in terms of what it can mean for us long, long term. But Bill was one of those very unusual people I discovered in Silicon Valley. There are dreamers and there are implementers. Uh, Bill is the kind of guy who can sit out and watch the stars at nighttime and project his mind uh, out cosmically to uh, 200 years from now, thinking about what future species may have descended from us or even from the computers that we build, uh, more or less from us, and then, at the same time, be able to take those kinds of ideas, turn them into incredibly innovative products, and build a shippable code, and actually go out and market the products himself. Uh, it's rare, if not uh, almost impossible, to find anybody who can do both the cosmic conceptualization all the way through to uh, shipping industrial strength code. And that's exactly what Bill Atkinson did with, with HyperCard. After Steve Jobs left Apple, uh, I was looking around to see whether the vision of the company was correct, to see uh, who I could get guidance from, from a technical standpoint. And Bill Atkinson was one of the people I turned to, as was Alan Kay. Uh, Alan, uh, I was to discover, uh, was someone who wasn't just the father of many of the ideas that we use today, like small talk and, and uh, other uh, parts of the human interface that are uh, well known today with Macintosh, uh, but he was someone who was even more interested in the kinds of computers that we would have out in the future. And the DynaBook, which Alan conceived a good number of years ago, was a product that still hadn't been built. Uh, it still held concepts uh, which were yet to be realized. And as I learned more from Alan, and he became almost my uh, Buddha master, uh, I discovered that not only was the vision that Steve Jobs had uh, the correct one, that one person, one computer, uh, one person at a time was the way to change the world, but that in fact we had only begun the journey. That this wasn't the end of a fad, uh, it wasn't the phenomenon of the 1980s. Perhaps a better analogy would be to uh, project ourselves backwards to 1915 and think about the automobile industry and imagine a conversation that would go something like, uh, now that the automobile has been discovered, uh, what shall we do after the automobile? And yet we saw that there was no such thing as mass personalized transportation until we had built the infrastructure of highways, until we had a petroleum industry, until we had a dealership network, until we had service stations, until we had an aftermarket uh, of companies that could uh, supply the various uh, other add-on products and replacement uh, parts and products which uh, automobiles needed. And we had to make the technology invisible. We had to go from the era of the machine enthusiast in the automobile industry to making the technology invisible with automatic transmission, with uh, power brakes. And that's exactly what's happening today with personal computers. You know, we are at the point where we have machine enthusiasts who love the technology, really care about what personal computing means for them, but we haven't yet seen mass personalized knowledge systems, the analog to the mass personalized transportation that took some 70 years in the automotive industry.
And that is going to require an infrastructure of telecommunications. It's going to require databases to be established that can be easily accessed regardless of their operating environments. And it's not unreasonable to expect that by the turn of this century, only some 12 years from now, that almost anything of interest in the world, whether it be in graphics, text, or sound, is going to be digitized. And in theory, it could be available and accessible, assuming that we had the proper devices to connect to it and we had the password clearances in order to, to uh, do that. So why aren't we demanding that our public education system begins to focus on developing in our young people the kinds of skills that they will need in the early 21st century in order to be successful in the world ahead and be able to maintain the innovation and creativity that we will need in order to be successfully able to add value and to keep our affluent middle class society and the world's marketplace alive and thriving. And I think that means uh, some fundamental reforms in public education and the personal computer has the chance of being more than a tool for computer literacy, more than a tool that is used in computer labs, but can become integrated in a very important way into the fabric of our learning process. And it means building the self-esteem of our teachers. It means putting a national priority on education that seems far amiss, regardless of which administration happens to be in power. It's a curious thing to me that when we look at our large institutions that are using information technology, that during the 1980s, the cost of technology has gone down dramatically on a price performance basis. And yet, the performance has gone up significantly, and nobody can measure real productivity gains. The old concept of taking large mainframe computers and taking the workflow and systematizing that so that work can be done faster gave us measurable productivity for about 15 or 20 years. But more recently, doing things faster isn't enough to get measurable productivity gains. We've got to learn how to do things better. Again, I believe the solutions are going to be found by focusing on the individuals inside those institutions, whether they're corporations or schools or government. Focus on the individuals, give them enabling tools that they can work with, and help change their behavior in terms of how they think and how they work and how they communicate and how they learn. And that is really the tremendous opportunity all of us have to be part of changing the world by using personal computers to have an impact on society that goes far beyond anything that has happened so far. As we look at the technology at the 21st century, uh, I envision a product which uh, I call the Knowledge Navigator. A navigator because we're going to want to be able to navigate our way through knowledge that will allow us to bridge areas of specialization. The over-specialization that we've had in our society today has restricted creativity. We've got to be able to bridge the sciences with the humanities. And think back to the precedent of the Renaissance in the 15th century when we had a wonderful invention in the year 1360 with the printing press, a tool that enabled individuals to be able to access knowledge, to democratize the book, the printed page. In 1360, only one out of 100 people was estimated to be able to read. 140 years later, in the year 1500, it's estimated that 80 out of 100 people could read and that books were no longer printed in Latin, but they were printed in the tongues of whatever was the spoken language at that time. It's hard to imagine whether we even have more than 80% literacy today in a highly industrialized country like the United States. That mere fact of democratizing knowledge started the Renaissance because it let people rediscover the golden age of Greece. It let them see a world through a series of perspectives that bridged the humanities and the arts and the mathematics and the philosophies and opened up a bandwidth of, of knowledge that was unknown during the Dark Ages. As we go into the 21st century, we are going to have to open up our own bandwidths and to move out of the Dark Ages 
of over-institutionalization and over-specialization, and we want at least an equivalent tool to the printing press. What is exciting to me is to see that when you go to the universities today, that you realize that it takes about 10 to 15 years for technology to incubate from the time that it's first discovered and invented until it appears in commercial products. That's about the time it's taken for many of the technologies that we had in the Apple II and in the Macintosh uh, to incubate and come out into commercial products that all of us are using today. Well, if that's true, it means that the technologies that are in the universities right now, the technologies that are in the laboratories, whether it's Apple Computer or other companies, that those are the technologies that we're probably going to see in products around the turn of the century, just 12 years from now. And I believe that all of the key technologies we need are already in place, uh, starting to evolve, you know, and will converge together around the turn of the century to give us a descendant of the Macintosh that will be even more intuitive and easy to use, one that will be even more powerful because it will include artificial intelligence capabilities. It will be one which will have extensive uh, networking capabilities regardless of the operating environments or where databases may reside, uh, probably very sophisticated object-oriented distributed database technologies, an extension of the object-oriented uh, concepts that we're using today in our, our personal computers and that we will have merged together the series of different uh, things like uh, video imaging uh, with text and sound windows, graphics uh, generated through simulation on a computer, so that we will have a true multimedia environment, an environment for learning tools, an environment for communication tools, an environment for work tools. And I believe that the multimedia environment will open up some extraordinary possibilities to return to the earlier theme of, of education. We're not competing with our personal computers today against books. We're competing against special effects in films. We're competing against MTV. We're competing against video arcade games for share of mind with our young people, because those are the real alternatives. So why can't we begin to take the idea that work can be fun, an idea that seemed contrarian to me and totally unconventional when I moved from the East Coast corporate America world that I had grown up to, to Silicon Valley, and yet today is one that makes so much sense to me. Because if you're having fun, you're probably doing something that's interesting to you. And if you're doing something that's interesting, you're probably going to have a better chance of coming up with doing things in a better way and be more productive than if you're doing something that's boring. And why shouldn't the same thing be true in learning as it is in work? Why shouldn't we make the process of learning as entertaining as it is to go to a film or go uh, play with a video arcade game? And I think that's totally going to be within our grasp with uh, the knowledge navigator concept of, of personal computing around the turn of the, of the century. What it validates for me is the vision that Focusing on the individual, enabling the individual with tools is going to be just as valid in the 21st century as it was back in 1977 when Apple was founded. It's not that this was a nifty idea for the 80s that somehow will exhaust itself, but it's that we are at the beginning of something which has only begun to touch people's lives, not just in the United States, but right across the world. And that is the kind of vision which excites us at Apple, because we came to Apple to change the world. We came to Apple to personally make a difference. And we came to Apple to learn and grow. Those are the only three promises we make an employee when they join our company. We don't promise lifetime uh, uh, tenure. We don't promise pensions. Uh, we don't promise it'll be easy. What we do promise is that you will have an absolutely, extraordinarily incredible experience, and that you will be part of an adventure. And when I say come to Apple, I don't mean just to sign up and have a badge and walk into our offices in Cupertino or any of our offices in other parts of the world. I mean in the greater Apple family, because what makes the third wave, the first wave was agrarian, the second industrial, the third wave is information society, what makes the third wave really different 
is that we no longer have corporations trying to be completely self-sufficient on their own. We no longer measure success by how large and independent a company is. We measure success by how innovative, how flexible, how high the quality standards are, and how well it is networked into interdependencies with other independent organizations. In our case, we have tremendous interdependencies. We have interdependencies with dealers, with software developers, with vendors of our piece parts and components. And perhaps most importantly, as we discovered in 1985, when many thought Apple was on the brink of extinction, you didn't. You, know, you the enthusiasts, understood that while we may not have been doing everything right in running our company, that the dream was essentially correct and the technologies were sound and the products with some modifications and more openness you know, could meet the needs of the marketplace. And you stuck with us. And that was probably as important in assuring that Apple made it through those tough times as anything else that I can think of. It's that network of relationships that makes the third wave companies so different from the second wave giants that we've seen in industrial America in the past. Well, I've talked a lot about some of the impressions that I've had in coming to Apple. You've seen a little bit of uh, what we still do today, and yes, we still have fun. Uh, there still is no dress code at Apple, and there still are beer busts on Friday afternoons, and we still celebrate milestones. And yes, we are a larger, more complex business. Uh, we're different in many ways as well. We sell into business uh, with much greater emphasis than we did a, a few years ago, and today we're doing it with some success. But we're still a company driven by a dream. And even as IBM starts to look more like Apple with user interface and three and a half inch diskettes, and Apple seems to look more like IBM as we you know, put on our suits and ties and go into corporate America through the front door, and <laughs> <laughs> we actually get in a few these days. <laughs> We're not turning into Ford and Chevy. The visions of the two companies are as different and distinct now as they ever were. I believe that IBM is focused on a vision of institutional productivity, customer control, and trying to build upon the very strong reputation it has as an outstanding service organization. It's one of the great companies in the world, without a question of a doubt. But the vision at Apple is a very different one. It's one that focuses on the individual. And it rests on one simple idea. And that idea is that the way to change the world is to give people tools to help them change their behavior. To have the epicenter on the individual, not the epicenter on the mainframe. The personal computer isn't just a smaller version of the giant ones that came before it. The personal computer is the doorway into information technology for individuals. And therefore, you've got to treat it with all the respect that it deserves. You can't compromise on the technology. You've got to make it as intuitive as possible without compromises. And these are the, the dreams that are as important to Apple as we go out into the 1990s as they were when we defined the Macintosh or we defined the Apple IIe or the Apple IIgs. Now, these are the things that are at the roots of the value of Apple Computer, and they won't change, regardless of how much else changes in the industry ahead. Well, thank you very much for the chance to be able to visit with you and talk tonight. Uh, I'd be happy to answer a few questions if you have. And it's a great pleasure to cross the country and be 3,000 miles away from home and yet feel that I'm still amongst friends. Thank you very much. <laughs>